Hi everyone, this is Ms. Romani, and during this lesson, we will start our exploration of pathogens and diseases by learning about viruses. And of course, there's this virus that is in everyone's mind, the coronavirus causing the current pandemic. So let's just start by clearing up some terminology, because you may have heard the terms COVID-19, coronavirus, and maybe even SARS. And in case that has been confusing, I want to clear up what each name refers to. COVID-19, or Coronavirus Disease 2019, is actually the name of the disease caused by the virus, not the name of the virus. The 19, of course, referring to the year that the disease entered the human population, which, as far as we know, happened late last year. The name of the virus is SARS-CoV-2 or Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. This name was chosen because the virus is genetically related to the coronavirus responsible for the SARS outbreak of 2003, which some of your parents may remember because that virus actually affected Toronto. And while related, the two viruses are different. As a matter of fact, there are many types of coronaviruses. Some of them are quite mild, and even are the cause of the common cold. So what is a virus then? Well, viruses are submicroscopic pathogens that can replicate only inside the living cells of an organism. Let's break that down. They're submicroscopic, which means that they cannot be seen with a regular microscope. In order to actually view a virus, we need to use a special type of microscope called an electron microscope. And they're pathogens, which means that they are something that cause disease. And viruses do not just infect humans. Viruses can actually infect all types of life forms. Animals, like us, can get viral infections, of course, but so can plants, so can fungi, and even microorganisms like bacteria and protists can also be infected by viruses. Essentially, anything that is living and has a cell can possibly be infected by a virus. And viruses come in many different types. There are millions of different types of viruses, and they can vary tremendously in structure. Here, you can see a few of them. On the top is a drawing of them showing some of their main parts. And on the bottom are actual photographs of them taken with an electron microscope. But as much as they vary, viruses have some common general structures. Oh, and by the way, let me just add one more here. Some of you may recognize this particular virus. This is the Ebola virus. And here's another virus that you might recognize as seen under the electron microscope. Do you recognize it? This is the coronavirus. So as you can see, viruses can vary tremendously in their structure, but they do have some commonalities. Viruses all contain their own genetic material. Uh, but that genetic material can actually be in the form of either DNA or RNA, depending on the virus. So some viruses will contain their genetic material as DNA, like, for example, this virus called a bacteriophage or bacteriophage, which is the type of virus that attacks bacteria, and, or the coronavirus, which is an RNA virus. And the DNA or RNA is wrapped inside a protein called a capsid. And here you can see the protein capsid in the bacteriophage, and here it is in the coronavirus. And some viruses also have some sort of lipid or fat envelope that surrounds the capsid, and it contains these protein spikes. So in the coronavirus, we can see this lipid envelope here in yellow, and the little protein spikes just drawn all around it. And these protein spikes can serve a variety of functions for the virus, but one of them, very important function, is that they act as keys that allow the viruses to enter the cells of the organisms which they infect. So, for example, the coronavirus has these protein spikes which attach perfectly to those little receptors that are found on the surface of human cells, which is how the coronavirus enters the cell, by attaching to these receptors and tricking the cell into letting them in. Now here's something neat. As you guys know, we are told repeatedly to wash our hands with soap to kill the coronavirus. But why is that? Well, this is where that lipid or fat envelope that surrounds the virus becomes important. When that layer of fat interacts with soap, the fat gets pulled out by the soap. Just like soap 
pulls apart grease when we wash our dishes. Soap literally pulls apart the virus and destroys it. Then we just rinse the fragments with water and wash it away down the drain. But we're told to wash our hands for a minimum of 20 seconds. So why specifically 20 seconds? Well, that's the length that it will take for the fatty layers of the virus to be completely destroyed. Let's take a look at what happens to these fatty layers in this experiment. So they did this experiment where they put a lotion uh, on people's hands that glows in UV light. And that lotion is there to mimic the fatty layer of viruses because that lotion would be you know, made out of probably some sort of fat or oil. So after washing their hands with soap for either 5 or 10 seconds, you can still see that the fat was left behind. But after washing for 20 seconds, it's all gone. So this is why we need to wash our hands for 20 seconds. Now there's one interesting thing about viruses and the fact that we study viruses in biology, which is the study of life, and is that technically viruses are not considered to be living things. And that's because there are seven criteria that all living things must meet, and viruses do not meet all seven criteria. So let's take a look at each of these criteria and see how viruses fare. So first, the most obvious one. Living things must be made of cells. Viruses are not made of cells. As we've learned, a virus particle is made up of a set of genes bundled within a protective protein shell called a capsid. Now, we know that some virus strains, like corona, do have an extra membrane or lipid layer that surrounds it, the fatty envelope. But that still does not make a virus a cell. You will not find any cytoplasm or ribosomes or even enzymes inside that envelope, and certainly no organelles. So viruses are not made of cells, so they are not alive. Now let's talk about something called homeostasis. Homeostasis is all about maintaining balance in response to changes in their environment. For example, can an organism control its internal temperature or its water content? We've now established that viruses are not made of cells. And without any organelles or molecules inside, viruses have no way to monitor what is happening inside or create changes in their internal environment, no matter what is happening outside themselves. For example, if it gets cold, we can shiver to raise our body temperature. We respond and adjust to temperature changes. Viruses cannot do that. If it gets cold outside, they just get cold. So that's actually two criteria. Viruses cannot maintain homeostasis or respond to their environment. Now let's talk about reproduction. And this is a tricky one because viruses definitely multiply and we will learn how in a minute. And while our immune system could certainly handle a single virus, it's the hundreds of thousands of them that replicate in our cells that cause disease. However, this replication cannot happen on its own. Viruses must use the host cell to create more viruses. Since viruses don't have organelles, nuclei, or even ribosomes, they don't have the tools they need to make new viruses. Instead, viruses enter living cells and then use the cell's equipment to copy its genetic information, then build new capsids, and assemble everything together. So, since they can't do it on their own, viruses cannot reproduce. Living things use energy. This criteria is a little bit tricky because it takes energy to make new viruses, and viruses do replicate. But we already established that it is the host cell that provides all the equipment and all the machinery that it's needed to make new viruses. It is also the cell that obtains and spends all the energy that is needed for this process. So viruses technically don't use or obtain energy. It is this host cell that does that. And living things grow. They use energy and nutrients to become larger in size or more complex, and viruses do not do that. So what about the last criteria? Heredity. Well, that's a tough one. 
because viruses do indeed have genetic material. They have either DNA or RNA, which is the basis of heredity. They have genes, and they pass on those genes to future generations of viruses. They can even evolve and change as their genes develop mutations. So this criteria is actually met. But since all criteria must be met to be considered alive, then viruses, in fact, are not alive. And so in conclusion, viruses are not living things because they don't meet all seven criteria to be considered alive. But I did mention that viruses have the ability to replicate. So let's take a look at how they do that. So like I said, a virus can only replicate when it is inside a host cell. There are viruses that can actually stay outside the host cell and simply inject their DNA or RNA into the cell. And there are those that enter the cell and release their DNA or RNA once inside the cell. Either way, the aim of the virus is to get their genetic material inside a living cell. And once there, viral replication can take one of two forms. The active stage of replication is called the lytic cycle. During the lytic cycle, the viral genetic material will, in a sense, hijack the cell's machinery into reading the viral genetic information and using that information to make hundreds of new viruses. Once made inside the cell, the viruses will completely fill the cell and the cell will burst or lice, which then releases the viruses. Or the viral particles can be released out of the cell without killing the cell, leaving the cell as a viral factory. Eventually, either the organism's immune system manages to fight and destroy the virus, or the virus can continue to be produced, causing cellular and tissue damage, and eventually killing the organism. For most viruses, this lytic cycle is it. This is how they replicate once they infect an organism. But some viruses have a second dormant stage as part of the replication cycle. Dormant, by the way, just means inactive or sleeping. These viruses do not immediately replicate once they have entered a cell. Instead, their viral DNA gets inserted and incorporated into the host DNA. And this way, every time the host DNA is copied, let's say prior to cell division, the viral DNA is copied right along with it. And this stage, which is called the lysogenic cycle, can last weeks or months or years with the viral DNA silently waiting in the host genome until one day something triggers an active or lytic cycle to start. And the trigger could be anything, for example, stress, UV radiation, a lowered immune system, or a lack of nutrients, say. But once triggered, the virus enters a lytic cycle of replication. Some diseases, like the herpes virus that, cause, that causes cold sores, undergoes this type of cycle. When in the lytic cycle, the patient would have sores, and the viral infection is very contagious. But when dormant in the lysogenic cycle, the virus is not contagious. The bad thing is that once the viral DNA becomes part of the patient's DNA, it is there for life, causing cold sores whenever the person's body triggers the lysogenic cycle of the virus to just enter into the lytic cycle. Now that we know how viruses replicate in our body cells, let's talk about a few diseases that they can cause. And the number of viruses that can cause viral diseases is huge. For example, well over 200 different virus strains are implicated in causing the common cold. And that's just a single disease. And one thing that you may have noticed is that whenever you get sick, no matter the cause, you tend to suffer from some common symptoms like fever, coughing, fatigue, and other symptoms that we often refer to as flu-like symptoms. And this can become confusing, especially during a pandemic, when if we get some symptoms, we cannot be sure of the cause. And the reason for these common symptoms is that the symptoms are caused by our own immune system's response to a viral infection. So whether we just have allergies, are fighting a cold, 
caught the flu or actually have COVID-19, we can sometimes be unsure based solely on the symptoms. However, there are some symptoms that are more commonly found associated with some viruses more than others. So let's take a look at the common cold to begin. The cold can be caused by over 200 different virus strains, although most, the most common ones are strains of rhinoviruses, which are depicted here. And there are some strains of coronavirus that also are responsible for the common cold. The common cold is usually a mild disease, and symptoms may appear less than two days after you've been exposed to the virus. These symptoms may include a sore throat, runny nose, sneezing, watery eyes, and a low fever. People usually recover in seven to 10 days, but those symptoms may last up to three weeks. Occasionally, people with other health problems may also develop pneumonia as a result of a cold, um, the common cold virus is typically transmitted via airborne droplets um, or direct contact with infected nasal secretions, I know, that sounds gross, or with contaminated objects. A common misconception is that you can catch a cold simply by being wet or being exposed to cold weather. But colds are viral. You catch them from other people if those people have the viral infection. But the thing is, is that the common cold, as well as the flu, for example, uh, tend to be more common during cold weather. And this is probably where that association came from. And the reason for that seasonality that is present with both colds and flus, which we usually call, you know, cold and flu season, has not really been determined conclusively. Like, there's no conclusive reason why that occurs. Now, there's very many explanations. One explanation is that maybe the cold weather can cause changes in our respiratory systems or can decrease our immune systems, um, which can possibly then make us more susceptible to these viruses. Or possibly the low humidity of winter can cause an increase in viral transmission rates. Maybe if dry or air allows the small viral droplets to disperse farther and then stay in the air longer. Or it could just be social factors, like people spending more time indoors near infected people, in particular children at school. And school happens to start in the fall, just as cold and flu season just begins. So there could be something to that. Now, influenza, commonly known as the flu, is an infectious disease caused by an influenza virus. And there are many different strains of influenza viruses. Some are more dangerous than others, and some can be transmitted to humans from birds, pigs, and other animals. Symptoms can be mild to severe, depending on the strain. The most common symptoms include high fever, body aches, runny nose, sore throat, coughing, feeling tired. These symptoms typically begin two days after exposure to the virus, and most last less than a week. The cough, however, may last for more than two weeks, depending on the person. In children, there may also be diarrhea and vomiting, but this is less common in adults. Oftentimes when people get diarrhea and vomiting and they think that they have like a stomach flu or what they call a 24-hour flu, is usually something called gastroenteritis, which is an unrelated disease that is not caused by the influenza virus. Now, complications of the flu could include pneumonia, sinus infections, or could worsen other health problems like asthma or heart failure. And just like the common cold, the flu is typically transmitted via airborne droplets or direct contact or contaminated objects. Now, as you may know, COVID-19 is a new disease. So the information in this lesson reflects current understanding of the disease and it could change as we learn more about it. The information, not the lesson, I'm recording it. Now, the disease was first identified in December of 2019 in Wuhan, China, and then became a public health emergency of international concern in January of 2020, and was subsequently recognized as a pandemic by the World Health Organization. It is caused by a strain of coronavirus called the SARS-CoV-2 first isolated from three people with pneumonia 
um, and connected to a cluster of acute respiratory illness in Wuhan. The disease is believed to have a zoonotic origin, which basically means that it may have entered the population, or at least the human population, from an animal source. Possibly either a bat or a pangolin based on genetic analysis of the virus. Symptoms of COVID-19 can be relatively nonspecific. The two most common symptoms are fever and dry cough. There are less common symptoms, which include fatigue, which basically means feeling tired, loss of the sense of smell and taste, shortness of breath, muscle and joint pain, sore throat, headache, chills, vomiting, coughing out blood, diarrhea, and a rash. Among those who develop symptoms, approximately one in five may become more seriously ill and have difficulty breathing. Emergency symptoms that would require immediate medical intervention would include difficulty breathing, uh, chest pain or pressure, sudden confusion, difficulty walking, if the face or the lips become bluish in color, uh, those would require immediate medical intervention. COVID-19 can lead to complications, including pneumonia, lung problems, low white cell counts, and kidney failure. And just like the common cold and the flu, the SARS-CoV-2 virus is typically transmitted via airborne droplets, direct contact, or contaminated objects, which is the reason why masks and washing hands and avoiding touching your face is the best way of avoiding getting the virus. The virus enters our bodies through our eyes, our nose, and our mouth. So if we avoid touching our face, we can avoid maybe bringing the virus from our hands if we've touched somewhere that has um, the virus into our bodies. And the reason why we wash our hands is in case we have touched something with the virus, we can remove them from our hands before we you know, touch our faces. Now, measles is another viral disease, it is a highly contagious infection uh, caused by a measles virus, also called the rubiola virus. Symptoms for measles usually develop 10 to 12 days after exposure to an infected person and can last between a week to 10 days. Initial symptoms typically include fever, um, often greater than 40 degrees Celsius, so pretty high fever, a cough, runny nose, and inflamed eyes. Then small white spots may form inside the mouth, basically about two to three days after the start of the other symptoms. And um, a red, very flat, very typical measles rash will usually start on the face and then spread to the rest of the body, typically about three to five days after the start of symptoms. Now complications of measles are rare, but they can be dangerous. Complications can lead to blindness, inflammation of the brain, and even death. Measles is an airborne disease, and it spreads very easily from one person to the next, uh, usually through coughs and sneezes of infected people. It is extremely contagious, like I said. Nine out of ten people who are not immune and share a space with an infected pe person will be infected. People are usually infectious to others from four days uh, before the developer rash to, to four days after the start of the rash. So the rash, which is usually the indication that a measles infection has happened, is not the onset of contagion. So people can be contagious even before they might know that they have the measles. And once a person has become infected, there is no cure. You just have to let the disease run its course. And thankfully, the measles vaccine is very, very effective at preventing the disease. Measles is one of the leading vaccine preventable causes of death in the world. In 1980, before measles vaccination was widely available, 2.6 million people died of it in that one year. In nine, it, by 2014, once global vaccination programs had been put in place, the number of deaths from measles dropped to 73,000. So from 2.6 million in one year to 73,000 in one year. That's what vaccination did. And despite these trends, though, rates of disease and death have unfortunately increased in the past few years. 
because of a decrease in immunization. Essentially, in the past few years, some parents have chosen not to vaccinate their children. Another viral disease is rabies, and rabies is a viral disease that causes inflammation of the brain in humans and other mammals. Early symptoms can include fever, but soon other symptoms appear, like depression, violent movements, uncontrolled excitement, fear of water, which we call hydrophobia, or an inability to move parts of the body, um, which can then lead to confusion and then loss of consciousness and death. And once symptoms appear, the result is nearly always death. The time period between contracting the disease and the start of symptoms is usually between one to three months, but can vary from less than one week to more than one year, depending on a variety of factors, but mostly uh, the distance the virus must travel through your nerves before they reach the central nervous system. So rabies is caused by... Uh, strain of viruses called the Lysa viruses, and it is spread when an infected animal bites or scratches a human or other animal. Saliva from an infected animal can also transmit rabies if the saliva comes in contact with the eyes, the mouth, or the nose, even without biting. And throughout the world, dogs are the most common animal involved in rabies transmissions. But in countries where dogs commonly um, do not have rabies because they get vaccinated or immunized against it, like for example in Canada, other animals are the most common routes. Like for example in Canada, uh, bats, raccoons, and skunks are the most common sources of rabies infections in humans. If you're bitten by a rabid animal or one that you suspect to be rabid, you can get a rabies vaccine, and but it has to be given um, before symptoms start. It is given in five doses over several days. If you get the vaccine before the symptoms start, then the vaccine will destroy the virus and you should be okay. But unfortunately, because the disease cannot be diagnosed until the, the symptoms begin, you have to basically preemptively take the vaccine. You can't just wait until symptoms begin because by then it's too late. Now, Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome, or AIDS, is a chronic, potentially life-threatening condition caused by a virus called the HIV virus, which is redundant because the V means virus, which stands for human immunodeficiency virus. Uh, HIV damages the human immune system and interferes with the body's ability to fight infection and to fight disease. So people with AIDS are not killed by AIDS. They die through secondary infections or cancers that the immune system cannot fight. HIV is a sexually transmitted infection, uh, but it can also spread by contact with infected blood, like, for example, using contaminated needles, or from mother to child during pregnancy, or through childbirth. But there is medication and there's um, things that can, ha that can be done to prevent that if the mother knows that she is HIV positive. HIV does not co cause AIDS right away. The virus enters a lysogenic stage or lysogenic cycle, and it may take years before HIV uh, becomes active and weakens the immune system to the point that a person develops AIDS. And even though there's no cure for HIV AIDS yet, there is medication that can dramatically slow the progression of the disease. And these drugs have reduced AIDS deaths in many developed nations significantly. And finally, let's talk about Ebola. Ebola hemorrhagic fever is caused by various strains of Ebola viruses. Signs and symptoms of Ebola typically start between two days and, or even three weeks after contracting the virus, and they start with a fever, sore throat, muscle pain, and headaches, uh, usually followed by vomiting, diarrhea, sometimes a rash, along with decreased function of the liver and kidneys. At this time, some people begin to bleed both internally and externally, which is the reason why it's called hemorrhagic fever, because it causes hemorrhage, which is bleeding. And the disease has a high risk of death, killing between 25% to 90% of those infected, so an average of about 50% um, death rate. And this is often due to the low blood pressure from fluid loss and 
usually follows 6 to 16 days after symptoms appear. The virus spreads not through the air, thankfully. It spreads through direct contact with body fluids, such as blood from infected humans or other animals, um, and feces, urine, saliva, and any other body fluids. So spread can occur with contamination directly with the body fluids or may even occur from contact with items that have recently been contaminated with body fluids. And this disease is a zoonotic disease, which means that it, its origin is some sort of animals. And in this particular case, fruit bats are believed to be the normal carrier of the virus. So there is one thing that I really want you to learn about the treatment of viral diseases. And that is that antibiotics are not a treatment for viral diseases. As we will learn in the lesson on bacteria, antibiotics only work on bacterial infections. Viral infections are commonly of limited duration, so treatment usually consists of just reducing the symptoms of the disease. Now, there are some antiviral drugs available for diseases like HIV or even some for the flu. And most of antivirals target specific viruses, but there are some broad spectrum antivirals that are affected against a wide variety of viruses. Antiviral drugs do not destroy the virus. Instead, what they do is they inhibit its lytic cycle. What they do is they mostly stop a virus from binding to a cell or stop them from assembling new viruses or from leaving the cell. Anything that will stop the virus from replicating. So they, it's our immune system kills the viruses, but antiviral drugs can stop the virus from replicating if effective. Um, since viruses use the cell's machinery, many, although not all, Antiviral drugs tend to inhibit some normal cell processes, and as a result, they have side effects. Ultimately, our biggest tool for fighting viruses is in the prevention of viral diseases and in limiting their spread through the process of vaccination. Vaccination uses our own immune system to fight viruses. Through a vaccine, what we do is we stimulate our immune system to produce these molecules called antibodies. And once antibodies for a virus have been produced in our immune cells, our immune system will remember and fight the virus before it can cause disease if we ever happen to encounter that virus in the future. A vaccine is often made from a weakened or killed form of the virus or one of its surface proteins. Just enough of the virus is in the vaccine to stimulate production of antibodies against the virus, but never viral particles that can cause disease. So vaccines can have side effects, like for example, a mild fever or pain around the injection site. But this is because vaccines stimulate our immune system and not because of the virus that you're being, being vaccinated against. There's a misconception that some people have that if they get a vaccine for a virus, that they might get the virus that they've been vaccinated against. And that's not true. Vaccines are made specifically to stimulate an immune response against the virus, but not to cause disease. And vaccines only contain either parts of the virus or a killed form of the virus or just one of its surface proteins, just enough to stimulate the production of antibodies and not enough ever to stimulate disease. If you're interested in learning more about vaccines, we will be covering vaccines in more detail in a later lesson. And so that's it for this lesson on viruses, everyone. Talk to you next time.